John Wilkes Booth was stimulated by his intense hostility to the administration of President Lincoln, desire for the establishment of the Southern Confederacy, and also by the delusive idea of winning enduring fame and the lasting gratitude of his countrymen of the South for being thus the instruments of retrieving the fortunes of their dying cause. He and his fellow conspirators had been engaged for months in making their preparations for the assassination of President Lincoln, Vice President Johnson, Secretary Seward, and General Grant. Booth had selected and arranged with Louis Payne to take an active part in the work of assassination. To a man of Booth's sagacity, a mere glance at Payne would be sufficient to impress him with the idea that he was one of the helpers he wanted, and as we find him as early as February, 1865, transplanted to Washington City by Booth and Surratt, and from that time on associating with them very intimately but very secretly. On the morning of the 14th of April, 1865, the President's messenger went to Ford's Theater in Washington City and engaged a private box for the President and General Grant, with their wives, to witness the play of Our American Cousin, which was to be rendered there that night. Booth had arranged with Payne to assassinate Secretary Seward at the same time that he would assassinate the President, and no doubt had planned for Payne, after accomplishing his task, to join him and Herald in their flight, crossing the eastern branch at the Navy Yard Bridge, and then to pass down through Maryland and cross the Potomac, at a selected point, into Virginia, where they might consider themselves as being safe amongst their friends. Secretary Seward received severe injuries from the upsetting of his carriage recently, and was lying in a critical condition under the care of Dr. Verdi. Booth had planned to take advantage of this circumstance for gaining admittance for pain into the sick chamber, where, by springing with the ferocity of a tiger upon the sick man, he might make quick work in dispatching him with his dagger. To this end he had prepared a package rolled up in paper, and had schooled Payne in the artifice, teaching him to represent himself as having been sent by Dr. Verdi with this package of medicine, which it was necessary he should deliver in person, as he had important verbal directions as to the manner of its use, which required him to see the secretary. At the same hour that Booth fired the fatal shot, Payne appeared at the door of Secretary Seward's house, in the guise of a messenger from Dr. Verdi, holding in his hand the package that Booth had prepared for him, and demanded to see the secretary, saying that he had a verbal message which was of particular importance in regard to the use, or application of, the medicine, and that he must see the secretary himself. Dr. Verdi had left his patient but a short time previous, and had consoled the family that had for days been suffering the greatest anxiety on account of the secretary's condition by taking a favorable view of the symptoms. The family, worn with watching and anxiety, were disposing of themselves for the night. The secretary's son, Major Seward, had retired to his room. Sergeant George Robinson, acting as attendant nurse, was watching by the bedside, in company with Miss Seward, the secretary's daughter. Frederick Seward occupied the room at the head of the stairs. All the rooms occupied by the secretary and his family were on the second floor, and were reached by a flight of stairs in the hallway. The second waiter, William Bell, was stationed at the hall door. Being somewhat relieved of their anxiety by the doctor's favorable view of the case, all were anticipating a night of quiet rest. The doorbell rang, and was responded to by Bell. Immediately upon his opening of the door, Payne stepped into the hall. He was a tall, broad-shouldered, muscular man, as agile and ferocious as a panther, a low-browed, scowling, villainous-looking specimen of humanity, the animal preponderating largely in every feature of his visage and expression of his countenance. There he stood, holding in his left hand the package, and keeping his right hand in his overcoat pocket. He demanded of the boy to be allowed to see the secretary, telling his story about being sent by Dr. Verdi to deliver the medicine with his directions. The porter told him that his orders were to admit no one, and that he could not see Mr. Seward, that he would deliver the package himself. To this Payne would not consent, but persisted in saying that he must see Mr. Seward. He was wearing heavy boots, and took no pains to walk lightly as he went up the stairs, whereupon the porter requested him not to make so much noise, to which, however, he paid no attention. As he approached the head of the stairs, he was met by Frederick Seward, who had been attracted by the noise, to whom he said, I want to see Mr. Seward. Frederick went into his father's room, and finding him asleep, returned saying, you cannot see him. All this time Payne stood holding out the package in his left hand, grasping with his right hand the pistol in his overcoat pocket. 
Frederick requested him to give him the package, saying he would deliver it, but Payne persisted in saying that that would not do, he must see Mr. Seward. Frederick finally said, I am the proprietor here, and his son, if you cannot leave your message with me, you cannot leave it at all. Payne still continued parleying with Frederick for some time, but finding that his talking availed nothing, he started as if to go downstairs. This, however, was only a feint on his part in order to throw Frederick off of his guard and to get rid of the porter who stood behind him. He again walked so heavily that the porter requested him not to make so much noise, but at that moment, Payne, having prepared himself for the encounter, turned quickly, and making a spring towards Frederick, struck him two or three times with the pistol, which he had all the time held in his hand, fracturing his skull and knocking him senseless to the floor. Having learned which was the room occupied by the secretary by seeing Frederick go into it, Payne rushed past the prostrate man, opened the door of the secretary's room, and was met by Sergeant Robinson. Having broken and thrown down his revolver in his encounter with Frederick, he had drawn his dagger, and at his first encounter with the sergeant he struck him with his knife, cutting an ugly gash in his forehead, and partially knocking him down. He then pressed rapidly forward, knife in hand, to where the man lay in his bed. Throwing himself upon him, he commenced striking at his face and neck with his dagger. The secretary was reclining in a half-sitting posture, having the coverings well drawn up about his neck and chin, to which circumstance the failure of the would-be assassin to take his life was no doubt due. The sergeant, as soon as he recovered his equilibrium, sprang upon Payne, and Major Seward, having been awakened by the screams of his sister, sprang into the room in his nightdress. Finding the sergeant grappling him in such a way as to hinder the effectiveness of his thrusts at the secretary, and probably thinking that he had accomplished his purpose, he turned his attention toward making his escape. In disentangling himself from the grasp of the two men who now had hold of him, he gave to Major Seward several severe cuts about the head and face, crying all the time, I am mad. Finally, pulling himself loose, he started to make his way to the street. Meeting Emmerich Hansel, another nurse, he made a thrust at him with his knife, inflicting an ugly wound. He left the house, leaving five of its inmates stabbed, cut, and bleeding behind him. Having reached the street, he deliberately threw his dagger away, mounted the horse which he had hitched in front of the door, and rode off. Thus, for the time being, this assassin passed from sight, having made good his retreat minus his dagger, hat, and revolver. Although Payne rode away so leisurely at the start, he put his horse to the top of his speed as soon as he had fairly cleared the streets and reached the suburbs of the city. About two hours later, a bay horse, saddled, and blind of an eye, came running up a by-road that led to Camp Barry, about three-fourths of a mile east of the capital, and was there halted and taken charge of and placed in General Anger's stables. The horse, when found, bore marks of having been ridden at a furious rate. The sweat was streaming from every pore and dripping to the ground. This was no doubt the horse rode by pain on that night. The most probable theory is, that being pushed and urged at a furious rate, and being blind of an eye, he stumbled and pitched headlong, throwing, and probably stunning, his rider, after which he regained his footing and made his escape before Payne had sufficiently recovered to get hold of him. The fact of his being a little lame when caught goes to sustain this theory. Thus was the would-be assassin prevented from joining his comrades, in their flight, and compelled to skulk and hide in the suburbs of the city for the next two days. He was without arms and hatless, and was compelled to throw away his overcoat, which was afterwards found on account of the bloodstains on its sleeves. He knew that the alarm would spread rapidly throughout the vicinity, and in his present condition he dared not venture out through the country, so he was compelled to spend the time in hiding and skulking until he was forced from his retreat by hunger. Making a covering for his head out of a sleeve from his undershirt, which he drew over it like a turban, he shouldered a pick, which he had stolen from the trenches, and at near the hour of midnight on the 17th he entered the city. He went directly to the house of Mrs. Surratt, as the safest place he could find to rest, hide, and refresh himself, and obtain an outfit in which he might make his escape. Unfortunately for him, as well as for Mrs. Surratt, the government had by this time come into possession of such information as justified it in sending its military police to that house, with orders to arrest its inmates.
it had been discovered that the house of Mrs. Surratt had been the headquarters of the conspirators in Washington City. The officer in charge of the police, Major Smith, had reached the house but a short time before Payne arrived. Payne came with his turban on his head, and the pick on his shoulder, and rang the doorbell. Major Smith responded to the bell, and asked him to come in. Seeing the officer, he said he believed he was mistaken in the house. Being asked whose house he sought, he replied, Mrs. Surratt's. The officer replied, this is the place, and drawing his revolver on him, ordered him to come in. Payne entered, and the officer closed the door. He then inquired who he was, and what he wanted. To these questions he replied that he was a poor man, and a laborer, and that Mrs. Surratt had sent for him to dig a drain for her. On being asked what brought him there at that time of night, he replied that he merely called to see what time Mrs. Surratt wanted him to go to work in the morning. The officer saw that his hands bore no marks of labor, and at once suspected he had caged one of the conspirators. He placed him under arrest and took him along with the others in the house, to General Anger's headquarters, where he was held for identification. Louis Payne, having been thus captured and identified, and Mrs. Mary E. Surratt, were the first amongst the conspirators to be held for trial and were later convicted and hanged. After the attack at Secretary Seward's, Dr. Verdi and two or three other surgeons were at once called to examine and treat the secretary, and the other victims of Payne's dagger. The house in which the onslaught was made had the appearance of a charnel house or slaughter pen. The secretary was found to have received three or four severe cuts about the face and neck, which were only made dangerous by the loss of blood they had occasioned and the weak condition of the patient. The secretary made a slow but good recovery. Of the other four wounded men, the wounds of Frederick Seward proved the most serious, as his skull had been fractured and depressed, so as to render him unconscious, from which condition he was only awakened by surgery. All finally recovered.